Uh, I came back down from the Hill because we are actually voting a ton of floor amendments through today for the NDAA, all the non-DOD ones, so the ones that probably matter most to you, the national security ones. Have been going through good news, they all pretty, you know, I left with two left and 24 of them had gone through, so I felt pretty good. Um, the, uh, so I, I will talk a little bit, I don't wanna do the whole origin story of the Cyberspace Learning Commission, a lot of you probably have an idea of what we were anyway, but I do think it's important to understand um, why we exist. We exist because um, Senator, I was working for Senator McCain for about two years after I retired from the Navy as his policy director. And Senator Sass and a couple other members kept coming to him and saying, hey look, deterrence isn't working in cyberspace. And that's a, a big thought, but it's the idea, what they really meant was bad actors are able to do a lot of things below what we consider the level of, we call it use of force, you might even call it the level of give a damn, you know, and, and the U.S. isn't responding. And what it's doing is it's establishing a new, uh, a new um, uh, uh, layer where, you know, a, a new rule set, where a set of business rules where, they, where criminals and non-state actors can operate with relative impunity. And we sat back and he said, go take a look at all the issues. So we came back to him and said, hey, you know, China, the OPM, this is about 2017 we're doing this, <clears throat> the Chinese theft of 24 million OPM records, including his own, you know, just as a reminder to him, uh, the, uh, the Chinese intellectual property theft, there was something called the Blair Commission that studied this, and <clears throat> their numbers probably aren't perfect, but their ballpark, and the ballpark was over a decade, about a trillion dollars, and probably lost GDP uh, due to intellectual property theft. And it's bigger than intellectual property theft, it's, it's coercion of, of uh, <clears throat> intellectual property uh, during joint, in, in joint agreements, things like that. We just had the Russian uh, uh, cyber-enabled information operations campaign against the 2016 election cycle. The North Korean attack on Sony was a really low point, and the government, knowing who did it, attributing it reasonably quickly internally and taking no action, and, and certainly no action that had a, a impact. The, the Iranian um, DDoS attacks in our banking system earlier in the decade, so we listed all these for him, and he's like, you know, this is, this is true. Look, we're stopping Russia or China is not doing massive cyber enabled attacks on our Northeast power grid, you know, because they know we'll respond. So deterrence is working at that very high level of state to state interaction with escalatory controls, but it's not working down here. So he said, look, <clears throat> he looked back at all the legislative efforts over the last seven or eight years, and he had been involved in some, probably not in a way he was happy with anymore. And he said, we, the government's not gonna fix this on their own. So go out there and come back to me with a, uh, a strategic approach for how we defend our national critical infrastructure, our R&D innovation base, and um, our democratic institutions, electoral institutions. And he said, don't waste my time with just a report. You know I won't read it. He passed away before we're done anyway, but he wouldn't have read it. He said, just give me the appendix of legislative recommendations. And uh, I just say fast forwarding, Senator King later adjusted that to write the legislative recommendations in legislative language and hand them to the committees. And so um, we went back and he said, McCain said, one year or less, four million dollars or less, one year of writing a report, two years of implementing legislation, and do it for under four million dollars. So we went and did, by the way, we did it for about three million. So one of the few times we hear the federal government say, we put some money back in the till. Uh, but one year later, we produced a report. Many of your companies, as I looked at the list, talked to us. We talked to 450 companies, international governments, state and local governments, academic institutions, federal government agencies. But we produced a report in about one year. Not, I won't go into what all the different policy recommendations are, but what I'll say is we came up, we came up with five or six big theories. One was that the Department of Defense was actually okay. I mean, there's things they had to change and there's some problems, certainly in their interaction with the DIB. But in terms of, is this Department of Defense building enough cyber mission force, national mission force? They're in the ballpark, they need to do more. We recommended they're now building more. They added four teams this year, they'll add 10 teams next year. That's overall good for everybody. Um, and they recognize that they need to actually defend their weapon systems. They don't do it, but they recognize it. And, and really, if there's one sad thing in Department of Defense, it's a generally positive state, uh, story. It's new weapon systems. Uh, GAO does a report every two to three years. They take 21 top big systems, and it's usually 0 for 21. 
had the cybersecurity mandated at the, end, at the beginning of the exercise in the final product. And these are all weapon systems you know. When you read them, I can say what they are. No one ever gave me the cheat sheet. But you read, they don't tell you the name of the weapon system, but you can tell after a while that's, that's an F-35. That's a Patriot missile. That's an Arleigh Burke class destroyer. And in every case, the, the service decides not to install cybersecurity in the devices to save money. Uh, cybersecurity is cut during the cutbacks and never added in the pu play pushbacks back in. And so cybersecurity is cut out. And then it's amazing the number of one or two star generals or admirals that will say, well, there's a chapeau of cybersecurity that rides over our networks. And I'm like, I haven't seen this chapeau. Can, uh, first, I'm not sure what a military chapeau is, but if you could show this to me. And they're like, well, I can't really describe it, but I know it's there. And I'm like, well, I can describe it. It's not, it's not existent. It's not there, and your system is now insecure. And we now know from Alice, you know, from the logistics systems in the F-35 and a few others, that we've had some real challenges. My point on this is even DOD has a little bit of issues, but our overall finding was DOD was in much better shape. The rest of the federal government not only had poor cybersecurity, and this is pre-solar winds where a lot of the things we said were validated, but on top of it, they did a poor job interacting with the private sector. They did not build the public-private collaboration. Now, there are some shining examples of success that make the broader point that it's, that it's a, a nightmare. Um, and uh, so he'd had us go look, go through all these things, produce the report. Um, the report came out. In addition, since then, we've done four white papers, three of which we've reduced, put out publicly. There's a total of about 60 legislative recommendations out there that, that we pushed, broad ones that we pushed. And some of them are big, like create a national cyber director. Some of them are, are small, like create a CISA, you know, an advisory committee to CISA of CISOs. Um, and, uh, and you can see, you know, we had pretty good success across most of them. I'll go in, in to them in some detail. I do want to say the, the thought we had, before I get off of it, uh, the strategic approach, is that the federal government, there are three things we weren't doing as a nation. Like, you can restore deterrence in cyberspace. If you think about what deterrence is, it's deterrence is saying, hey, I I'm going to defend myself. I'm going to impose cost on you, and, and I'm going to try to work with allies and partners to dissuade you not to do things. Those are the kind of three tenets of deterrence. And, and the, the issue was that in all three areas, we're doing a, a pretty poor job. The first thing we said was we actually have to defend ourselves. And this was a, the federal government, this is almost like our COVID response in the sense that we weren't, this was a non, cyber is a non-traditional national security emergency. So we weren't thinking properly. So, and here's what I mean. The, uh, the federal government would say to itself, well, we're doing every, when it comes to a, we own every plane, tank, you know, submarine out there. So if we have to defend ourselves, we know how to spend more money on the planes, tanks, and submarines. But we don't own the national critical infrastructure, and we hadn't thought about this. And we, were, of course, didn't have to because of geography. You know, planes, tanks, and submarines of the foreign adversaries don't really impact our domestic security. But cyber does. Cyber removes that geographic advantage. So we came to the conclusion that we actually have to spend money to defend ourselves. And that's a two-step solution. One is that businesses who own that critical infrastructure need to spend more money to defend themselves. And there is a broad inconsistency across this, as I'll talk about in a second. And then the government has to do a much, it owes a much better, higher level of support to the agents, to the, to the companies trying to defend themselves. And uh, I think the, uh, you know, the commission came to the conclusion, and we discussed it a little bit in our paper, that there are some uh, infrastructures that are doing a pretty good job in cyberspace defending themselves. If you think about big banks, you know, I don't know exact. I don't think all eight of the big banks spend seven hundred fifty million dollars a year on cybersecurity. I think that's a slightly high number, but they all spend. We'll just say five hundred million dollars a year. That's more than most federal agencies. That's most than most governments around the world in cybersecurity. Why are they defending themselves? They've been under cyber militia. They've been suffering from cyber malicious activity for twenty years maybe 25 years or 28 years. And so, you know, they have a responsibility to protect, you know, their stockholders' interest, and they have defended themselves. I've been to at least three banks' op centers, big banks, and they are impressive, their cyber op centers. They look like a three or four star general admiral's op center. I don't know if they work that way. I'm not smart enough on the specifics of what they're looking at, but it struck me as someone who built op centers for three and four stars that this was a pretty good setup. Um, you know, and you can go to some energy companies and find high quality 
data flow and, and uh, cybersecurity information distribution and, and, effort, and a lot of uh, resources being applied. But you can also go to a water, most water utilities in our country, and I've now been to about 45 water utilities, and I think I'm old for 45 on walking away impressed. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. Water, water took advantage like pipelines did and some electrical di uh, distribution and highly automated themselves. You know, very few of the water, even the most rural water distribution I went to, the most kind of like I really wondered where they got their money, they had automated valves and pumps. There was someone back at a, at a computer saying open pump, I mean open valve start pump. The chemical injection systems that put in the, lot, the trisodium phosphate, the chemicals that change the pH of the water and get it right, that's all done automated. The testing in the dump valves that decide, hey, the water's good, not good, put it into the, into the city water or don't, all automated. So what used to be operated by 10 or 12 field operators is now operated by one or two you know, op center operators, saving a lot of money in those water industries, in the pipeline industry. But I think what we found was very little of the savings of automation is pumped back into the cybersecurity, the systems that have replaced the people. And so we found that in a number of infrastructures and industries, there was not enough being spent on defense. So one of our big issues is, hey, they have to spend money on defense. And, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Everyone's vulnerable now because at least our criminal adversaries have figured out you can monetize any data or digital service. And what I mean by that is you can, you, they can monetize it for ransomware purposes. They can monetize your business operations by taking control of them so you can't access them and bill people. They can take, they can take control of your field operations you know, and create, you know, disrupt services and create havoc. They can take, uh, take a hold of your, of your customer billing data and PPI. That's probably the most popular one. And then finally, they could take a hold of your CEO's email account and just search discussions with GC about sensitive topics and create reputational damage for you. So there's all these ways that all of us are subject to this monetization. So what we found was that there's a whole bunch of infrastructures that now need to pull themselves up to a certain level of information security. So that's the, what we thought was industry's part. And we've talked about that. We, you know, we're, we're loath to legislate that, but we'll get if the government gets closer to doing a better job doing their job, industry probably ought to be worried about the government taking a hard look at whether they're spending enough. I think if you're in this group right here, your company's probably thinking about it properly. I, I, wouldn't, I can't say that's a clean 100%, but you know, generally speaking, mostly this isn't an error of commission, it's errors of omission, a lack of understanding of what the threat is, less uh, recognizing the threat and deciding it's still not worth the effort. So um, you know, we did come down with some recommendations on how to improve the cyber ecosystem. But the bigger problem, the one the federal government needed to attack right away, was that the federal government was being a poor, is a poor partner. You know, we've talked hard. I, I wrote the first National Infrastructure Assurance Plan in 1999 when I was working at the NSC for Dick Clark. And when you look at the 70 plus recommendations we had in there, I would say maybe 20, but for the government to take action to help the private sector, I'd say we've done, completed 25% of them. And even for the government, 25% completion rate over 23 years is, is poor performance. Um, you know, that is not acceptable. And what's happened is the government has just non-traditional national security emergency. If you weren't counterterrorism, it was kind of shunted aside. And you saw this in the COVID preparations and response, and we're seeing it in cyber as well. It's, it's very hard for the government to organize itself for a national security emergency that doesn't start and end in the Department of Defense. And so we've got to work, the government's got to work much better. So some of the laws that we passed last year and the ones that we're most asking the administration to take good action on is uh, the first is the strengthening of CISA. Um, we took a hard look at CISA and I think your choices were find another place or strengthen CISA. The current path of CISA being under-resourced and unfocused was not okay. I think CISA was doing a great job of public outreach, explaining you know, that there's, an, I think Chris Gribbs was fantastic externally. But I think internally, inside the government, they weren't being able to get, get the, uh, the, the, the government organized. And I think that's because of the seniority of the people involved. And that's why 
we said you need to strengthen CISA and provide a national cyber director. And I think if we bring those two tools together, the government can first of all be, or they can have a coach and a quarterback, you know, to use a football analogy, you know, to get ourselves organized. Because we just didn't, what we had were about 25 quarterbacks with no coach, you know, with all these principal agencies out there. And, and most um, cabinet level agencies were not that interested in Chris Krebs telling them how to do their job better inside their agency. When it's a cabinet level official from the, Nash, from the White House, uh, we're hoping the National Cyber Director can have a little more impact on how federal agencies see their responsibilities. So we had to get the government organized, so it strengthen CISA, create the National Cyber Director, and then the third one was um, strengthen the, the accountability and oversight of the federal agencies that work with infrastructure, so energy, treasury, EPA, um, DHS in a few areas, Department of Transportation, uh, there's a total of, of uh, nine federal agencies that do the 16 critical infrastructures. But the, um, what happened was they didn't have a rule set. So if you look at how Department of Energy handled it with an organization called CSER, which had about a $205 million budget and 75 people, and then you looked at how EPA Water, the, the oper Division of, of Office of Water did it with four people and you know, $10 million, obviously something's exceptionally out of kilter there because the water job's actually harder. You still are talking about providing a utility service to 360 million people, but it's with 50,000 water instead of about 3,000 electrical power, right? So I mean, you had a much harder job with 7% of the resources. And so that was like an easy fix. So we said, hey, you sector, you have to get these sectors organized. So get CISA stronger, establish a national cyber director, and then get the federal agencies working better. So all three of those were put into law. Those were, the, I thought, the big three law changes last year outside of DOD. We had some big ones in DOD. But the, uh, get those three law changes in. And so what we're asking the Biden administration to do is really push hard on getting these done. And I think they are, the National Cyber Director's set up. I think they're a tiny bit slow on it. It's, it turns out doing a startup inside the federal government is two words that should not be stitched together in the same uh, sentence. And so Chris Inglis, who's absolutely the best possible choice the president could have made. Uh, it's gonna struggle for three to four months. And then I think sometime late this fall, he'll begin to become the center of gravity of the administration. And then a year or two from now, we'll consider the National Cyber Director a given. I think Jenny Easterly's jumped right in there and she's grabbed a bunch of the stuff we passed to strengthen says of the Joint Cyber Planning Office. And from that, created the Joint Center Cyber Defense Collaborative. I do worry about the government when they either change the name or add names and uh, lots of acronyms into things, but I, I believe in the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative because I believe that what she's saying is we're not, we can't have a joint cyber, a cyber planning office without having the private sector in it from day one. And she forced her, her, her agency's hand, right? Because if you allowed CISA to set up the JCPO on their own, just the normal day-to-day -day working of CISA, they would have said, let's get our act together first then we'll invite in the other federal agencies in about a year, and then we'll invite the private sector in about two years. Maybe state and local, and then the private sector. And then, you know, the, the key partner in this, the private sector, would have been coming in in year two or three. So she completely short-circuited that by announcing the JCDC and inviting private, I think she already has about 10 companies in that. Now look, I think if you say, if you physically organize the JCDC in this ballroom and then you guys came in and looked behind the curtain, you'd see like a little old man on a microphone, you know, kind of talking like Wizard of Oz. It's, I don't think there's any there there yet, but as long as the expectation management is, there's going to be there there. It's going to bring together the Joint Cyber Planning Office. It's gonna to bring together the Integrated Cybersecurity Center, which is the data flow among the federal government. And it's going to bring in the, something that's in the uh, House Armed Services Committee bill that came through today, that it was called the Joint Collaborative Environment. It's again been renamed because that's how we are, but it's a center for the exchange of information or something. It's got some name in there, but I promise you it's the Joint Collaborative Environment, the idea of a classified and unclassified networks to share information with the private sector. If you bring those all together in two to three years and have had the private sector on the ground floor from the beginning saying, no, if, if you do this with all lemons instead of a mix of lemons and oranges, we're gonna have a problem. Uh, I think this is the right way to do it. It's just expectations have to be set that there's not a lot behind the curtain on day one, but I'd rather be there for the planning and, and get it right with the private sector. I don't think we have that many more chances at this. 
So that's, we've asked them to, to work those three big issues. And then um, uh, the, I do think there's, a, there's some my other ones that, are, that we passed last year that I'm worried about. One's called continuity, the, we passed, it's called continuity of the economy. This is the idea, um, we've all seen like Kiefer Sutherland and you know, designated survivor, you know, survivor kind of like continuity of the presidency, continuity of ops, right? You sit back and you think, what do we do? Who is making sure that we have a resilient, reliable, dependable economic restoration plan following this? Because that's the actual sense of our strength as a country. Do we have one that's integrated across federal agencies? If we start to lose, you know, let's say we do have a serious problem with the Northeast Power Grid, and it's, a, it's an aggressive, it's, um, it's a malicious actor who's installed secondary and tertiary attacks so that after you start to recover, they take you back down again and again, and you're, you're down for six or eight days. That could have an incredibly deleterious effect on our national economy, to not be running our major exchanges out of the New York, New Jersey area for six or eight days. I mean, after 9-11, one of our jobs in the White House was to get power and continuity back up there in you know, 48 hours. And then some of you may know the story, but we had a major transfer taken out, I think, behind World Trade Center Building 5 right in that area there. To, there was no 14,000 volt transformer just sitting around being ready to be reinstalled. So I think we went to Georgia Power, who was about to install, they were doing like a 40 year change out of a transformer and we said, hey, let us have that transformer. We'll get you another, the government will, you know, we'll make sure you get another one. And we helped make the broker the deal so that this transformer went up to New York, New Jersey, you know, went up to New York to be installed. My point is, you know, that's a micro example of what has to be happening at a macro scale in continuity of the economy planning. How do you, how do you, how do you ensure that the, that the uh, degradation of conditions is manageable and the restoration is rapid? And uh, that kind of continuity of the economy planning wasn't happening. And here's how, why it wasn't happening. There's about 15 federal agencies involved. Zero want to be in charge. There's only one federal agency that could do it with ease. That's the Department of Defense. There's one federal agency that's 100% sure they should not be in charge. That's the Department of Defense. So when you have this kind of condition, no one is responsible and no one's gonna do anything. This was the ultimate in Senator McCain's, like someone from the outside's gotta hit us upside the head. So we wrote this continuity of the economy planning law that we're now directed and the president has to pick a, pick a loser, so to speak, but someone to be in charge. Our belief is it's the, Department of Homeland Security, Secretary Mayorkas, and I think he gets his, his stick and rudder on this, his guidance from the D National Cyber Director, and then the D Department of Defense is gonna get assigned with providing a whole lot of planning support, but we've gotta dig into this. Now, the Department of Defense doesn't understand the water distribution system in the Midwest, well, the Army Corps of Engineers might, I shouldn't say that, but you know, you know, the Department of Defense planners aren't experts on this critical infrastructure. The federal agencies working with their private sector partners are. So this is a really complex issue about how you do it. And you know, the end result of this should be grid X exercises that are truly cross domain, you know, that, are, that aren't planned by energy, but instead are planned by DHS for everybody. everybody. And every, no one's simulated. Everyone plays it, you know, pl plays it in a complex way, and then we're running these kind of complex exercises. But they need to be testing plans that have been developed. So you develop plans, run them in complex exercises, adjust the plans for all the failures you detect, and then develop new plans, and that's the concept. So that continuity the economy ones that we're pushing hard for the Biden administration to do. In fact, tomorrow, Easterly, Director Easterly and, um, and uh, Chris Inglis are up on the Hill, and I. I've you know, hopefully planted with enough members questions to ask them to kind of, kind of needle them to get started on this because the one mistake we made is we gave them two years, which means for the first 18 months the federal government's gonna do nothing. Then they're gonna light their hair on fire for the last six months and try to get something done. So we're gonna try to push them to get started now at the six month part, vice the 18 month part. So, uh, and then this year there'll be some new legislation that we're working with the administration on um, I think the biggest piece in there, um, it is not a, I, I think it's about a 50-50 chance. It's a systemically important critical infrastructure. It's taking what used to be section, or is section nine of EO 13636, what are the actual, it's identifying what are the actual critical functions for our economy. 
with no opt-outs this time. So if we determine your critical, fu critical function, your critical function, you, you can opt out of participating, but you can't opt out of being identified by the government as a critical function. And then for those critical functions, what are the, we're, we're gonna ask CISA to come back to us after working with the private sector, what are the proper benefits and burdens of being that critical function, that thing for which the loss of this critical function would have a significant deleterious effect on the national security, economic stability, or health and human safety for our, for our nation? And what are the proper benefits? Like, sh what should we be providing better intelligence support, better ability to dictate what intelligence we try to collect? You know, for you, um, liability protection, if you participate in this. Uh, and what are the requirements? You know, that you have to meet certain, you know, uh, cybersecurity benchmarks, which like for someone like the major banks will be uh, been there, done that moment. But for a lot of water utilities, might be a never heard of it moment, you know, so that, that and then, um, and then that liability protection would be like, if you were meeting these standards and there was third party assessments and you're attacked, you have some liability protection. And I think that's reasonable because let's say you're a southern company, you're, you're a production plant somewhere and a Russian cruise missile hits you. We don't expect that, well, you know, you really should have had a cruise missile defense system around that base. Uh, and as a result, you're liable for any loss of business operations that happen. I mean, that's not, that isn't what happens. You would be treated as if, that company would be treated as if it was subjected to an act of war and it would be protected. In the cyberspace right now, I don't know that that's true. When you have a Russian or Chinese APT working you over and you begin to drop business operations and don't provide a contracted service, I don't know what your protection is going to be. I know in Europe they're going through this in the judicial system right now associated with the NotPetya attacks of almost four years ago, you know, Maersk, Mondelay, and a few others. But I don't know how the U.S. judicial system would see that, so I think we should intervene legislatively and say, this is how we will see it, which is that if you're subjected, if you're properly securing yourself, you're being assessed by a third party, and you're subjected to an attack, you're protected. You know, you're legally protected. And uh, so that's, that's how we're looking at it. So, to me, that's the biggest one we're pushing. I think the last one I'd comment on, because I think it's, most people are thinking about it, is um, required incident reporting. And you've probably seen there's two sets of bills. There's a, Rub a Warner Rubio bill in the Senate with a 24-hour reporting requirement and some interesting penalty scenarios. And then there's um, Clark Catco coming out of the House with a 72-hour reporting requirement uh, a different type of penalty situation. Um, I think Clark Catco is the most likely path. Uh, the commission would, has, the commission thinks one of the two needs to pass. So if Clark Catco were ripped up and burned to the ground, we'd probably support Runo, Warber, Warner Rubio just to get something. On the other hand, I think Clark Catco is probably a better bill. I suspect to get it through the HISGAC, the Senate, Homeland uh, Committee, they're going to need to add some ransomware language. So there'll probably be specific reporting requirements, like when you pay, did you pay a ransom? Who did you pay it to? How did you pay it? Um, I, I, the, I'm not going to say whether it's a good bill or not. I'll say that um, this is coming. It's not surprising this is happening after such a unusual performance you know, by some of the CEOs after like Colonial and a few other issues in front of the HISGAC. They were, ex some senior, you know, industry were pretty evasive. And then like a day or two later did press releases with all the information the Senate was asking for. I will just tell you my opinion. If you, if you tell a Senator I don't really need to respond to your oversight and then put that same information out a couple days later, you're going to find out how he mandatorily oversights you, right? And that's that he passes a law. So I think this ransomware law, it's probably the right thing to do anyway. It's, it's a likely thing to happen now. So I think it'll be added into one of the information, uh, information uh, reporting. I also say that there are incident reporting uh, legislations. I'll say one last thing on this, which is we really, in the federal government, we don't have a concept of how much ransomware is happening. When we talk to lawyers kind of who give us pro bono work off the record, they say in our firm that we advise companies on ransomware incidents and we read about 
12 to 15 percent of what happens later in the paper. So 85 to 88 percent is not reported publicly. That's a large number. I mean, I can't think of another kind of illicit activity where it's generally accepted that 12 to 15 percent reporting is okay. So maybe that ransomware reporting requirement is required. So it, should I roll into Q&A? Uh, hey, Admiral, thanks very much for your time and, and for the uh, comments. Um, I want International norms have come up throughout the past day or two, yeah. and there has been a, um, there's a argument that says do international norms for all sectors at the same time, even if it goes really, 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 really slowly. And there's been an argument sometimes that says do sector by sector norms, right? Go protect the financial system, protect yeah. elections, protect hospitals. Um, and State Department, I think, and White House have at different times battled back and forth over this. I wanted to know kind of your and the Commission's view uh, on that and how we achieve results, yeah. whichever path you take. So thanks. Uh, that's a good question. It, first, I support the sanctioning of Suez. I think this is the right thing to do. Um, I think it's, it's definitely the right thing to do if we hear about two or three more company, similar companies over the next three or four weeks where, you know, they expand this to get the industry. I think, you know, if you believe their advisory, 40% of the business being done by Suez was illicit behavior. Yeah, that's a pretty high percentage. Um, the, uh, I think that's right. I don't think it's a product of either side winning that. It's a product of ransomware becoming too hot to handle. And they really can't say, they can't ban ransomware payments. Because they'd have to caveat it with, unless you're a hospital who, where people are going to die if you don't make the payment in the next hour, you know, the list of caveats would start flowing out of that. And the power company would go, well, our power is to that hospital. And they die, you know, and the water would be, well, it's a water to the power plant to the, you know, next thing you know, who's, you know, who's not caveated. So I think this is much more a product of we need to be seen as doing more on ransomware. This is the right thing to be doing. We should be sanctioning companies who support illicit behavior being conducted in our country. It, it may not be a head-on attack, and, and there's still much to be said about we should be doing more with Russia directly, who are supporting the ransomware as a service providers in their country. And I don't, think, I don't think there's a significant sea change from five months ago. I don't think President Putin came back from the meeting with President Biden and said, you know what, we gotta change our behavior, boys. I think what he said was, don't be so stupid, right? And so they moved uh, down to you know, Sophie, uh, Sochi, and then, you know, tried something else. So who has the next question? Tim? Uh, could I ask people to uh, introduce themselves to the Admiral? Yeah. Uh, that was Melian Papadopoulos, President of the Good Harbor Security Risk Management. Yep. You may know his boss. I do. I do. <laughs> so, uh, Tim Callahan, I'm the Global CISO at AFLAC, as well as the NTSC Board Chair. Uh, and, you know, you, you brought up some subjects that, that I... I I hope there's a lot of dialogue on. I mean, it's like the 72-hour, 24-hour notification that becomes the devil's in the detail, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, many times we have incidents, we're still trying to figure out if it's an incident in 72 hours. And, and we've, we've ran across this several times in kind of the HIPAA, you know, requirements is, uh, you know, we, we, we go to great lengths to discover, is there an incident, is there, has data left the organization, all of those things. And if we find out it has, we've already breached the, the time requirement, right? Because forensics takes a long time. And I, I would just, you know, be very cautious about putting those kind of aggressive timelines yeah. uh, in, in, into any kind of law with, without understanding the ramifications. And, I, I don't know if you yeah, have any so thoughts I, on that. Well, first of all, I agree with you. The false positive rate is, is going to, for 24 hours, would be way too high. Yeah. I, I think my answer on 72 hours is it'll be high initially, but I think that's a good aspirational goal. I, look, I'm not in, I have to be careful, I didn't mathematically set any of these, you yeah, know, yeah. but I agree 24 is too fast. Yeah. I, and, you know, we talked to Tom Fanning, and he's like 24. I mean, I couldn't even get my hands around how many times I'd have to say, oops, not that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I think 72 is something to work towards. So I think 72 is realistic. And as, I think as long as it's 72 thing. hours upon confirmation. Now, if I have a ransomware attack, yeah. that's reasonable, right? Because I know I have a ransomware yeah. attack, right? Yeah. But it's not necessary in, in some yeah. of the other. Let me right. ask one other thing on that, though, and, and now go back to your questions. The, um, the other challenge we have on this is 
probably, if I asked senior senators who were around in 2015, they'd say, you know, industry's done a pretty good job of evading the intent of the 2015 CISA reporting. They've taken that definition of significant incident and they redefine, see if an incident, in my mind, this may not be fair, is what the CEO determines, do you want this release or not? No, okay, it's not a significant incident. Yeah. You know, and I know that's not fair, yeah. but that's the perception. And so you're working against that. So I think 72 hours is probably something we'll probably have to get our hands around. I, I imagine it's going to settle in at 72 hours, yeah. would be my bet. Yeah. 24 was, re was unrealistic, though. Yeah, and, and then, you know, I, I really like the, the position that, uh, you know, we have some indemnity as long as we've, you know, implemented a framework that, mm -hmm. in other words, we're doing everything we can yeah. reasonably uh, we can. The assessment uh, part of it is uh, a little bit concerning. We, we were going through, as I was building the program at AFLAC, we were doing annual assessments. You know, and that was more to confirm that we're hitting our maturity target. Uh, and then we implemented a, an internal program that's monitored by our uh, general auditor, uh, 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 which is more of an internal assessment, formal internal assessment, so that we could go to a three-year. Because what we are finding is an annual assessment, it takes about three months. There's 12 months in a year, you're taking three months of the, the cyber team's uh, effort to participate in the assessment. Yeah, I should. I hope I didn't say annual assessment. Okay. I think, I think what well, I'd that's say what I was asking. Third yeah. party assessment. Yeah, is one way of looking at it. Now that third party can be someone that you you're using already if they meet a standard. Yeah. I yeah. mean, we're going to have to do that. I don't. There's not enough pros from Dover floating around to both help you for your own internal purposes and then meet this government yeah. certification. Yeah. So I mean, but. I guess the point I'm making is yeah. all of these things have ramifications yeah. at the CISO level that in some cases we just can't meet. I mean, we're, we're already spending probably 1% of our global revenue, 14% of our IT budget, and then if, it, it, yeah. you know, it, 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 there's just some pressures there, so. Well, 14% is great, by the way. One of the other, one of our talking points, this is hard to prove, I get in trouble, is so we'll say something like, you should spend between 8 to 12% of your IT budget on cybersecurity, depending on what your business op is. Now, knowing what your business op is, above 12 might be reasonable. I don't want to get you in trouble. I don't want your CFO going, great, let's drop it. Uh, you know, the, uh, so, but, you know, I think there are a lot of companies below 8%. Because in the end, especially if you weren't a traditional victim or target, but what's, what I was saying with that data monetization is almost, VIX dry cleaners can be a target. because the, the amount of small ball ransomware going on in Florida last summer was jaw dropping. By small ball, I mean six to $8,000 ransoms. These are being done by US perpetrators, you know, as well as foreign, but US were definitely involved in this. I mean, I even think Baltimore started out small ball the first time. The second time when they came back, they asked for a little bit more money, and then Baltimore took it to like an, ex you know, to like an extreme very quickly. You know, and I think, it, I think the restoration cost them significantly more than the ransom would have been, a and the loss of credibility as a, as a provider of services, as a, as a municipality as well. Um, but look, I, I want to be clear. I think there are a lot of companies doing the right thing. And we do see that. And, and generally, they're the ones who show up for meetings. You know, I think the ones that don't are where, the, are where there's a risk decision being made and the CISO is not necessarily being marginalized, but is assuming a lot of the risk for the CEO. And uh, in the end, I think what's coming around now is it's risk for the CEO as well. I mean, what's really happening is reputational damage to the company. Yes, sir. Hi, Admiral. Um, Jason Whitty, Global uh, Chief Information Security Officer, J.P. Morgan Chase, and yeah. uh, for the next two weeks, and then I'm uh, actually uh, starting as the CSO for USAA uh, going forward. I have um, a problem with a current insurance claim with USAA, so I'd like to speak to you afterwards. Hey, let me know. I'll bring it right on in. I'll give you Marjorie's phone number. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Dead serious. Let me know. <laughs> Hey, um, so there's there's a lot of the financial services CISO community that 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 has over the past. First off, thank you so much for your work on the Solarium Commission. Yeah. I know a lot of lot of uh, financial services uh, input went into that, and yeah. strongly support um, almost all of the recommendations. So that that was fantastic work. 
um, specific to SICI and that particular designation, mm -hmm. a lot of the financial services CISOs just kind of see that as redundant with yeah. Section 9. So can you help me articulate? Because the way that you yeah. said that bef just a few minutes ago was different from how I've heard anybody else articulate that. But just like what are we going to – what is the government going to get different? What is the you know the critical infrastructure side going to get differently with SICI versus what we've had with Section yeah. 9? So first, we've had to change SICI to be a two-step process. Like the first year will be identify the critical functions. First, we want you to know that it's you. I mean, there are some people who are fighting us where I'm like, well, you're not, you don't have to worry about this anyway. But you know how to say that. So I'd rather, you know, DHS says a determine what the critical, working with the federal, uh, with the agencies, determine what the critical functions are. But we ought to identify, plus Congress wants to know, who are we putting these requirements on? It, we need to know, that's a fair statement. Um, you know, I think we're not quite in an international emergency yet, so we probably ought to, you know, do things diligently. So first, the first step. And then what we're asking is, CISA come back with the benefits and burdens. And what I've said before is, look, this may not apply to like the first bank at Cleveland, but for the big banks, they meet the they'll meet the standard of care that, that is required in Section 9. What we're trying to do is say, you know, if you're a big bank and you're an A+, plus, right, you're doing great, but that, that energy company that's providing power into the urban environment that you're in, they're a, a B+, plus. and you're like, yeah, I can live with that. But almost all energy production requires municipal water as a cooling effluent, right? Now, these are the grades you know, that I told my kids to never get. You know, this is D minuses and Fs. So you, you're only as strong as your weakest link in this. So what we try to tell financial services is this is about having a standard of care of diligence, or you know, a standard of care for cybersecurity, and bringing up the lowest to the, you know, bringing up that lowest common denominator. And, and we're trying to more clearly write the law that says this isn't a new regulatory regime. It's using existing regulatory regimes meet the DHS standard. You know, if I was at one of the seven, you know, the banks that are in the FSR, I would not be, you know, fretting at night that this, you know, to get Houston water up this, we're not going to try to put them above the current financial, you know, the current banks. I, we're going to try to get everyone up to a step. If you're above it already, the reason you're going to do better is because you have your own, your own metrics for doing better. And, and, or, and maybe it's more criminal behavior that you're worried about than, nation state attacks, you know, that really try to take down a whole critical infrastructure. So I try to explain it that way. And so we've asked CISA to come back with the benefits and burdens. But the idea is the benefit is if you meet a, a standard of care, it's assessed by a third party, you're doing your job, and, a, and an APT comes after you. And I say this, APTs have come after banks and power and water already in our country over the last seven years, at least two different, three different countries. I mean, where they've actually come after the industry, not a single entity, but multiple entities within an industry. You, you'll have, you know, the goal is to try to get you liability protection for law, you know, for specific issue of lost business, you know, where, where you're, being, you're being held liable for your failure to deliver a service when you're under an attack by an APT. We don't think that's appropriate. If it was a cruise, like I said, if it was a cruise missile attack, no one would even think that's okay. But because it's cyber, it's like assume some sort of of kind of like, well, we don't know it's Russia. Well, yeah, we do know it's Russia. We, there's a reasonable attribution here. So we'll try to do a better job. We're, we're meeting with BPI today. I mean, my, not me, because I I think I've, you know, I've ruined, I'm, I'm done talking to BPI, but that's the Banking Policy Institute. We find services who are good people, but agree, disagree with us on SICKI. But I think if we don't get this done, we'll get a worse bill done after a big hit. The whole idea here is to get this done incrementally now instead of in a crisis three years from now when we really do have an infrastructure, a, a, a cross-infrastructure damaging incident. And the last, one thing I'll say on this, and you guys know risk better than anybody, the, the connectivity of our systems, which is a great thing, is increasing exponentially in our country. Of course, that is a big risk driver for cybersecurity, big risk driver exponential. The availability of increasingly sophisticated tools to our adversaries, increasing exponentially. So your two risk drivers are exponential. Your, your one risk mitigator is cybersecurity investments. Who, who here would claim their cybersecurity investments are increasing exponentially? No one. It's linear, and it might be in a slight uptick. So if your two risk drivers are exponential and your one risk mitigator is linear, you know, I learned in calculus a long time ago, that's called like 
a butt ton of risk, right, that's being introduced into the system. And the only way that's going to get solved is if the government comes in to help you close it and does a better job. So, sorry, go back to you. No, that's all right, Admiral. Thank you. Um, question for you. You and I chatted just briefly before you, you went on about the NDAA and yeah. a number of provisions that are actually being passed today as we speak. Can you give us a, a, an insight into how you think those um, different initiatives that are being included in the NDAA will kind of help this group? Yeah. What do so, you think? So none are being passed today. They're being included in the House NDAA to be conferenced in November with the Senate. And we won't pass an NDA till like, I want to get home for Christmas, kind of our fight that breaks out in the Senate and the House, right? And then they say, okay, we're getting home for Christmas. December 23rd would be my bet. Um, so with that in mind, I think the big one in there is the incident reporting is in there, and it's the 72-hour one. And as I said, my bet is that's the one that passes. But I can be proven wrong. in a heartbeat. I can be, if Senator Peters wakes up and says, you know, I like Warner Rubio this morning, then 24 hours is probably back in play. Um, another big one is the joint collaborative environment. The, hey, we've got a, this is a big bill. It's how do we get the federal government to share information at speed of data instead of a phone call between op centers, which is the current system of, you know, like we send hostages, they're called LNOs, between op centers. You see something going on, you're like, call, you're at the CIA op center, you call the FBI, oh, did you, you heard about this issue? They're like, yeah, we're, we're tracking it too, or we're not. We'll go take a look. Maybe it's an outlook, you know, maybe it's an email. It's not speed of data. So we've got to connect the cybersecurity through speed of data. And then we have to do that with the private sector things. The one that's running now, it's not the example for everybody, but there's a crisp system in the energy infrastructure for exchanging information. Got to figure out how to do that. And there needs to be unclassified where we're exchanging like data and, and volumes of what's going on where you can kind of sift for trends or for attack patterns, things like that. But then it also has to be a classified discussion where you can get analyst to analyst, where the NSA can hear or see something, but since they don't have a relevant expertise in this kind of technology or, or business operation, they need to be talking to someone from Verizon or Southern Company or JP Morgan, you know, somebody who has that kind of expertise to get a better understanding of what's going on here. So that is a big one. There's simple things like a five-year term for the CISA director. There's some improvements in the NCD hiring language, national cyber director. There's one I love, uh, personally. I, I, you just had the um, year, year up person. So I'm pushing hard for something called VA upskilling, which is the idea, when I transition out of the military, you know, you're, whether you're an admiral or a private, you get like a week of god-awful training you know, on how to get hired in the private sector, what to do. What we want to do is say people can opt for a second week where they go for IT upskilling. What that means is we, we have 215,000 people a year or so get out of the military. I'd say about 100,000 have reasonable IT training, but only about 5,000 have like the certificates associated with that. So at this VA upskilling, they'd understand what does the certificate require? How could you close? The, we'll see if the government can maybe help close that gap, get them the certificates. So start to produce like a significant number, a valuable number to the nation of you know, 20 or 30,000 extra people leaving with their certification each year, and they have clearances. I mean, this makes these, this is good for them, they just became eminently hireable. If the government's smart, before any of you show up, OPM will show up and say, hey, that plus, you want to amortize, you want it to get some value out of that eight years you did in the Army? Because you're leaving it on the table when you quit. But if you go work for the federal government, that can become part of your retirement. You know, come on over, and we'll, you know, that plus your IT certificate plus your clearance, you can start as a GS 12, 13, or 14, you know, not a GS 8 or 9. You can beat that post office job they were offering at the last brief. You know, and so, and then, of course, if they say, you know, I was getting out of the military because I was getting out of the government, they can come work for you. But if they have a clearance and they have certificates and they have military leadership experience, they have value. And, uh, and I think it'd be fantastic. And that's not an insignificant number. We're starting with a pilot program because you don't want to freak VA out. But, in, you know, but we're, that one passed about 10 minutes before I walked in here. I wouldn't have come down if, if it had because I would have had to stick around. That one mattered. But it's a small thing, but it's a small thing that can have big impacts, I think, long term if we do it right. Yes, Mark, thank you very much. We really appreciate you being here today. 
Um, shall we give him one more round of applause, please? Hey, can I ask one question? Do you have a water CISO in your CISO? Mm -hmm. A water industry CISO? The water? But there, see, American Water Association has a CISO. I prom there's, so the way, just real quick on water, because you should worry. Water is our, it's our next Waterloo, so to speak. I mean, it's the next big battle. We're going to fight three battles, the commission, on our way out over the next nine months. Water, workforce, and healthcare. Because I consider water the Achilles heel of our national critical infrastructure. Workforce, the cheapest way to fix everything. But obviously hard, or we would have done it. We're not a stupid country. You know, there's a reason the heat map is always 500,000. It's been like stuck. I, when I do the heat map, I have to like say, are you sure you updated? Because it's the same numbers I read. Like, this is the heat map of cybersecurity jobs. You're like, there's no way this thing's stuck. You know, but we're stuck, and the gov federal government stuck for 20 years, and then healthcare. I think it's weird that an industry that's tackled HIPAA, it, which is hard, cybersecurity is, is it's, it's hard too, but I don't think it's as hard as HIPAA. Cybersecurity is not okay in the healthcare industry. And whether we're talking about devices, diagnostics, in the servers actually in the hospitals, I think, I think there's a work to do there. We're not sure about where all the, where that's going to go. The water one, I'm, I got my hands around already. But I'd love, but there are good. There is American Water. So there's like two private water. Water is 87 percent municipality, which is ooh, and then it's about 10 or 12 percent private companies. So I've got to come find some of these private companies because some of them are doing water okay, because they have to make they have to convince a CEO they're doing things right, and they have to be they're responsible to shareholders, in a way that. Municipal governments aren't responsible to us as taxpayers. Uh, and so we just got to figure that one out. So if you find someone like that, sir, that would help me because I, I need to find what right looks like in the industry because I just haven't sorted it out yet. Thanks. And, and you know workforce is very important to us as well. Yeah. So we should discuss that. Well, I'll come back to you. When, when we've got our workforce ideas, you know, we did one workforce paper, but we're going to re redo it for next spring, for next year's NDAA, uh, and uh, uh, we'll just all be doing it pro bono then, you know, because the, we'll stand down as a commission. But I'll come back to you all for some, to get your all's input, because we, it matters what you, we're trying to solve your problem and the government's problem. Side. You can't solve one without the other. If the federal government starts to hire more people, you'll just come grab them. If, if it turns out that that's really working, you would wisely just offer a little more money, and you know you'll you know we'll, we'll have our problem again. So we need to we need to solve the problem for everybody simultaneously. Yeah, if we had uh, another hour, yeah. I, I'd love to talk about uh, workforce and um, a national cyber scholarship or service program, which yeah. I briefly discussed with you back in July. Uh, you know, we did a white paper on that, and when you unpack the, you know, the number of how many job openings, when you unpack that and start comparing that with certifications versus job openings, you'd suddenly realize that at the uh, entry level, we have more than enough, but when you get up into the seven to nine years, it's really scarce, and, and I think the ability to funnel people into the federal government for six years and then they can say that's a funnel for the federal government and then they can also come to the private sector and fill these roles is, is a great solution for all of us. So we're going to be coming back to you and talking to you about that soon. Good. I look forward to it. Thank you all very much. I appreciate Thank it. You.